Great. Okay. Um, well, hopefully everyone who is joining us is either joining us or will follow along shortly. Um, so uh, hello and welcome to everyone to the second of the audience agency's tea breaks series. Um, hopefully you've got a cup of tea and a biscuit handy. Um, I feel like I'm cheating slightly because I've got coffee rather than tea, but you know, I'm sure we're all, all allowed to bend the rules slightly. Um, today we are going to be talking a bit about audiences for uh, what we've referred to as contemporary art forms. Um, now clearly all sorts of art forms are contemporary in, in different ways and indeed you have lots of interesting debates about what really counts as contemporary which indeed I suspect we may end up having um, either yeah, later in this discussion or, or further on. Um, but what we're looking at is we've seen at this particular moment in time that when we look at who's likely to be engaging in the future um, in terms of um, in the post-COVID return, um, that there's a particular likelihood of audiences for more contemporary work um, which returns. We've, it felt like it now was quite a good moment to, to tune into that and to think about what it is that some of these art forms have in common, um, who's engaging with them, um, what that looks like. Um, and hopefully to hear a bit about from you, about your experiences, um, um, or you know, particular questions you've got or examples uh, that you've got to share. We're aware there's a bit of a variety between the different art forms we might be talking about, but hopefully as well, some commonalities um, as well that we can sort of link between them. So in, ter in terms of today's session, we're going to be talking initially uh, about a couple of um, little pieces of analysis that we've done, um, starting off with my colleague Elise, um, who you may be able to see there waving, um, looking at um, some of the audience finder um, data, so the sort of ticketing data that we've got. Um, and then I'll be talking a little bit about some work from the Cultural Participation Monitor. Um, and both these bits of work are coming out of some work we've been looking at with the Sheffield um, Performance and Audiences Research um, Group, um, at, or SPARC, um, at the University of Sheffield. Um, and they've done a whole load of other work into contemporary audiences, which We've signposted on the community, but we you know, would warmly recommend you to go and have a look at that because they've done lots of really in-depth interviews um, with audiences across multiple different cities in different contemporary art forms. So there's some really kind of rich qualitative work there. Um, we're largely going to be talking initially at least about quantitative work, um, but hopefully the conversations um, as they flow will kind of pull out different aspects as well. Um, so that's the format of the session. We'll also have a response from one of our senior consultants, Catherine Bradley, um, who's done all sorts of work with different um, uh, contemporary organisations of different types. Um, and then there'll be a chance for you to ask questions, to share your thoughts and, and feedback as well. Um, before we get into all of that, um, I'm going to invite my colleague Nathan to give us a little introduction to the community, um, which is our kind of our website where we can have um, further conversations. Um, but just a little bit of a practical stuff in advance. You've hopefully seen that it's being recorded. We'll stop recording for the Q&A so you can you know, say what you like without it being documented. Um, there is auto transcription, which hopefully you um, can see the, the link on screen, um, but that's available for your use. Um, and obviously do please keep your mic off if you're, if you're not talking, um, but equally, you know, when we get to Q&A and stuff later, then do please join in, share your thoughts. Um, so first up, um, can I pass over to Nathan to explain um, about our community and where we can go as our kind of tea break after party to, to chat more about this if we want to. So Nathan. Thanks very much, Oli. Um, yes, as uh, as Oli mentioned, one place that a uh, resource that I'd like to kind of just briefly direct your attention to is the audience agency community. Um, which is kind of a, a forum that we're developing, kind of expanding all the time, where you can kind of ask questions, find information related to kind of the audience agency's kind of products and services and, and crucially kind of our research, but as well as sort of, in addition to that, kind of generally shape the debate and ask questions and potentially kind of hear from your peers and things. Um, as that relates to this event, we have a kind of a specific events space and a kind of a post which relates to this um, this very tea break, where um, we'll be we'll be kind of posting some of the kind of notes and things from the talk today, 
as well as providing a space to kind of continue the conversation should you wish to. Um, just wanted to kind of briefly highlight that for your guys' attention. Um, but uh, yeah, and we'll kind of post the link to the specific event so that you can follow up as and when, but um, just wanted to, to mention that in passing at the top. Brilliant. And just to confirm, it's really simple to sign up if you haven't already. Um, just follow the link and it'll give you... Props. Super simple. Yeah, absolutely. Fabulous. Well, if we head over to Elise now for the first of our little bits of bits of data. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in. My name is Elise and I'm the Evidence and Insights Researcher at the Audience Agency. Uh, for the audio description, I am a white woman with short black hair wearing a red jumper today. And um, to start us off, we're going to look at um, what our audience finder data set can tell us about contemporary audiences. So as most of you will know, I'm sure, um, we aggregate ticketing data from hundreds of organizations across the UK every year. And uh, that allows us to gather insights about different art forms and different audiences to different art forms. Um, and so we're looking at the contemporary art forms that are available to us in Audience Finder, and those are written there in the top right-hand corner, uh, contemporary ballet, contemporary classical, contemporary dance, plays, and drama new writing. Those were the ones we selected for today. Um, specifically, we're looking at pre-COVID years, so up to 2018-19 financial year just to get an idea of how these audiences typically behave without um, COVID sort of getting in the way and interfering in the picture. Um, so over those four typical financial years, we're looking at about 52,000 performances in these five art forms across 180 organizations in the UK. And these um, performances attracted 2.3 million individual bookers across these four years which brought in 315 million pounds in income. Just to give you a general overview. Um, I'll throw, talk through what's on the screen here. Uh, feel free to put any questions in the chat if anything isn't clear. And uh, I'm just gonna talk through the data to get us started. And then we'll discuss more later about what it actually all means. So to start off in this top left corner here, the pink, um, uh, donut charts. We're looking at four years combined and the proportion of performances that are from London organizations. In, a, in our sample of 180 organizations, we had only 24 who were from London. And uh, what we saw is that those 24 London organizations put on almost a third of all performances across the four years, 32%. And not only that, but these organizations also brought in almost half of the total income. That's 49%, uh, which represents about 157 million pounds across the four years. Um, so that's just to show, to get us started, sort of the split that we have across the country of organizations and their prominence in these contemporary art forms. Uh, moving to the lower left corner, uh, those line charts there, looking at the change year on year to kind of see ticketing trends. Uh, now, just to explain quickly what we're looking at here, it's a chart of the index against the financial year 2015-16. So this is just an easy way to visualize and compare change without worrying about actual figures. And the reason for that is that we're looking at number of performances in dark blue there, bookers in light blue, and total income in orange. And as I was explaining at the start, Performances are in uh, the order of um, of, of uh, thousands, whereas income is in the order of millions. So we can drop them together in the same place. So that's why an index um, shows the change without needing to worry about the order of magnitude. Um, so how to read this chart? Line 100 in the middle, that's a bit darker, is the value of 2015-16. And then each line below represents a decrease and a line of 100 represents an increase. So for example, the orange line, the income, um, goes up to, you can see the line 130, which means that there was a 30% increase in income in 2017-18 compared to our first year, 2015-16. Um, in actual numbers, that means it went from 69 million to 89 million pounds for our five art forms combined. Um, 
as and so what this sitting trends chart really shows us is there's been a uh, a global slight but global trend upwards for all of those measures uh, for bookers and income and performance numbers of performances um, across the board, even though it's quite slight, really we're ending up around 10% or 20% above um, in the space of about four years. But we're seeing quite consistent numbers for contemporary art forms is what that's showing us. For the years we're not included, either because of COVID or performance categorization slowing down because of COVID. Um, but this picture that we're seeing pre-COVID, we're expecting it to still be valid um, out from the rest of our uh, research that we're doing. Um, now looking at the right-hand side, we have audience spectrum profiling, and um, I hope most of you will be familiar with that. Uh, it's our uh, bespoke segmentation of uh, the population by uh, cultural habits. And so this is the profile for these five contemporary art forms combined compared to the profile that we're seeing if we take all of the art forms in Audience Finder all together. So how do contemporary art forms differ from other art forms in Audience Finder? Well, how do the audiences differ really? Um, and so what that shows us is the higher engaged groups, especially metrocultural uh, and commuter land culture buffs are not only the most prominent groups, but also the most overrepresented in contemporary audiences compared to all, all audiences. Um, although there's a lot of geometry dependables as well, they are actually underrepresented. You can see that gray bar is higher. Um, and we also see a smaller proportion of trips and treats and slightly more home and heritage than in other art forms. Um, we're not seeing perhaps a prominence of our uh, segments that might have more, uh, that might be associated with younger audiences, like it might have been something you would have expected and that is not the case. So um, we might see a bit later how, uh, why that might be the case. And then just to, just to quickly touch on uh, comparing the art forms themselves, there is a particularly high proportion of Metaculturals and Kaleidoscope Creativity in the contemporary dance and drama new writing uh, art forms. And this could be due to the fact that those art forms were put on by organizations in London, maybe, since we know that these groups are very dominant in the capital city. Um, and on the other hand, and culture groups are very dominant in the other art forms, uh, contemporary ballet, classical, and plays. Um, so that's sort of a quick whistle stop overview of um, what the ticketing data can tell us about contemporary art forms. And now I'm going to hand back over to Ollie to talk us through findings from our participation monitor. Great, thanks Elise. Um, and reminded by your, your intro, I should do a little description of myself for the tape, so to speak. Um, I'm a middle-aged white male with blonde hair, blue eyes and black t-shirt. Um, black t-shirt feels appropriate to talk about contemporary arts, doesn't it? Um, so, um, uh, the next little bit I'm going to be talking about is based on the Cultural Participation Monitor, uh, which is a nationally representative survey of, um, so of the whole population, um, weighted by region, by age, by um, ethnicity and various other attributes. Um, and it's been done in various different waves, but this is based on um, data we captured in November. Um, however, alongside us asking questions that were very specific to that moment and how people were reacting to COVID at the time, we also asked more general questions about the kinds of things people tended to like and the kinds of things people tended to be interested in. Um, and that's what I'll be drawing on uh, for this bit. So, um, we asked people which of various art forms they were interested in, um, but we then followed that up with a question which said, um, as listed here, of the arts you're interested in, how much of it would you consider to be um, the following? Um, and so for each of these five options, uh, we gave them a scale from 0 to 10 um, to say, you know, yes, a lot of the stuff I like is classical or traditional, or is contemporary or modern, or is popular or mainstream. So um, we gave them these five different options. It's clearly not everything you could say about things you're interested in, but it gave us a bit of a flavour of, you know, which types of things tended to go together or, or how, how, do they, how do they fit. Um, now, for the purposes here, 
um, we've then taken those responses on a naught to scan text 10 scale and split them out into three groups, um, which roughly speaking were about a third of the um, population each. Um, so we've called any response that was naught to three as low, anything seven to 10 as high, anything between as medium. Um, and of course, because we're looking at these two questions, particularly um, for this session, essentially classical versus contemporary, um, we can then take the results of each of those two and compare them. So when we talk about people's taste, you know, the kinds of stuff that people tend to like to engage in, um, we often talk about it as if there's a really sort of neat trade-off. You know, are you someone that likes traditional stuff? Are you stuff, someone that likes really contemporary stuff? Um, as if the more you like one, the less you like the other. Um, if that was the case, you would expect to see um, more people, oh, someone's clicking and moving me on, um, you'd expect to see more people um, in those stream corner boxes, um, high, so this one here, the high and low and top left, or bottom right, the low and high combination, um, and you'd expect to see fewer people um, on the other axis. So if we just, um, so you'd expect to see lots of people on, on this row, um, but in fact, what we're seeing is that most people are arranged in the other direction. So almost six out of 10 people are giving the same rough rating to the amount that they like classical, the amount they like contemporary. Um, so the first thing I guess to, to, to flag from that is that although we often talk about it as a trade-off between these two different things, really, um, the more dominant dimension is, are you really into arts and culture or are you not? You know, are these the types of categories you use overall or are they not? Um, so that's the first thing to note. Um, the second thing to note is that we can look at who people were that gave these different responses. Um, so for the sake of simplicity, we've just looked at the extreme cases. So we look at these four different corners. So people that said they were low for both, people who said they were high for both, high classical, low contemporary, high contemporary, low classical, um, to get a bit of a sense of how are these different groups different from each other. Um, and this is throwing up something which picks up on some of what um, Elise was talking about earlier, um, but much of it, but not all of it, might sort of fit with um, what, you, what you may expect. Um, now there's lots of detail here and we'll share the slides um, on the community so you can have access to um, all of this information but I'm just going to drop in on particular particular bits of it. Um, starting off with that group in the top right hand corner. So this is the group who say that they very engaged with classical, very engaged with contemporary, you know they like um, a lot of what they do is both of these things um, and it has a predominance of the two groups that we expect to be really highly engaged with including um, contemporary stuff, so metro culturals and experience seekers. Um, and that connected to that, it skews towards London, towards high managerial occupations, towards people with higher educational attainment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that in itself isn't hugely surprising, except that it's worth noting that those really engaged groups are more likely to be there than they are um, to be just in the contemporary um, corner. So you know, there is a kind of commonality across these, across these fields. Um, because they're really highly engaged, they've been most engaged before COVID, they're most engaged during it, uh, and that's true in person, online, doing creative activities, all sorts of things. Um, and they're most likely to have booked ahead, they're most, you know, they're most keen, they're you know, expecting to attend. Um, however, that doesn't mean they don't have reservations or concerns about COVID. Now, caveat, this is from a couple of months back, um, but worth noting that this group isn't necessarily gung-ho, they're just really invested. So they're probably a really good prospect, but they're, yeah, they're not, it's by no means a sort of, um, they're, they're not, not a bother. Oops, something's gone wrong there. What's happened? Sorry, for some reason, that's just disappeared. Let's come back to where we were. And I will try not to brush any more crumbs off my screen. Um, so, um, in terms of the other two groups, then um, we've got um, people who are really into contemporary stuff but not classical. Um, actually, um, 
it's less those groups that you might stereotypically assume, although experience seekers are um, overrepresented a little bit. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a wider variety of other groups. Um, and again, really culturally engaged during the pandemic, we've seen this kind of pattern all the way through that contemporaneous and youth, because um, this is quite a young group, both strongly linked to continuing engagement through this period. Um, but this group are much less likely to be concerned about attending. Um, so when we talk about contemporary art forms being the place where you're expecting to see really kind of um, uh, sort of stronger responses um, coming back, um, that is this group. Um, and yes, this includes contemporary opera. Um, in terms of the opposite group, um, high classical, low contemporary, Again, this skews how you might expect. It tends to be more affluent, um, rural, white, older, um, no children in the household, just to be, just to be clear about that. Um, but those are the groups that we saw real reduction of engagement during COVID, more hesitation to attend beyond it. Um, one other thing just to spell out from here, because um, it says prepare to return with the same measures, that's because we, those in this group that had come back to events. Sorry, is this sound okay? Should I put it in my headphones? Um, so those who had attended from that group um, didn't say that they wanted more measures coming back, even though that group overall were relatively um, reluctant and, and concerned. Um, and then finally, the fourth group. Um, uh, oh, come back to that. More expensive to attend contemporary outside London than inside. Um, hmm, I think, can we come back to that in the, the Q&A? That's an interesting one. Um, so the, that final bottom corner, um, they're less interested in both. And indeed they scored lower on all the other different attributes we offered. You know, do you like stuff that's contemporary or different or popular or mainstream? They're just less culturally interested um, in all sorts of different ways. Um, tend to be lower income um, and white and more rural, more routine occupations on average. Um, they don't have particular COVID concerns to re-attending, it's just they don't want to come. Um, so that's kind of the distinctive attributes of that group. Um, so hopefully you can see from that that we've got quite a difference between some of these different um, groups in terms of the kinds of things people are interested in. Um, that there's a lot of crossover between some of these um, key groups in terms of contemporary and classical engagement, that the idea of being highly culturally engaged is as important as particular differentiations of taste. Um, but I will pass over to Catherine to say a little bit more about what that might all mean. If it will let me. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm just going to sort of talk through some observations just uh, to start off by describing myself. Um, I am a white female with um, short sort of reddish, reddish fair hair uh, and I'm wearing glasses and a black top. Um, so the immediate, the sort of first, first sort of point I wanted to make um, was that um, the high crossover that we're seeing in the results for, from the um, cultural participation monitor between people with, um, and, with a strong interest in both cl classical and contemporary art forms really reinforces existing knowledge that, that many contemporary arts audiences are generally highly engaged and confident cultural consumers and that they have a really wide range of tastes. And this sort of, sort of suggested to me that there might be a need in many situations to think perhaps less about targeting contemporary audiences and more about targeting perhaps what we might call avid cultural consumers. Um, I think it really raises opportunities uh, to encourage crossover between classical and contemporary products that might be within individual organisations, that could be uh, via partnerships um, and as part of a, a mixed programming uh, and in particular for urban venues. Um, overall, uh, the biggest audience opportunity that we're seeing, as, as highlighted for contemporary work, is amongst um, highly culturally engaged urban populations. 
And there's a good opportunity emerging from the pandemic with, the, with these groups, um, as long as um, COVID safety reassurance is catered for and communicated. And, and as discussed, that, that's something that's sort of still important for that particular group. Um, we know too that, that those interested in contemporary art forms have a tendency towards both digital and in-person engagement. So that really suggests opportunities across both on and offline strategies to engage people uh, with contemporary arts. Just going back to the sort of first slide now and, and the audience finder data, um, something really interesting here, this, this, this really shows the high potential and value of the audience spectrum group commuter land culture buffs to contemporary arts. And as we saw, they're the largest group across all the combined contemporary art forms. Um, when we read their profile, it kind of demonstrates more of a leaning overall towards traditional art forms. So this, this might might not be expected but but we do know that a significant proportion also attend contemporary art forms and this is very much backed up by these findings i think just one thing to say on this particular group though in terms of a little bit more challenge perhaps in getting them back um, after the pandemic and in re-engaging them after the pandemic given 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 more reluctance uh, amongst that group um Kind of related to this as well, um, in the audience finder data, we can also see um, a significance more generally of those audience spectrum groups we wouldn't necessarily expect to have an interest in contemporary arts. And this is particularly the, particularly the case where these groups have an existing interest in that art form overall. So, for example, the top three um, audience spectrum groups for all types of classical music overall um, a commuter land culture bus, dormitory dependables, and home and heritage. And these are also the same top three groups in the contemporary classical music profile uh, for audience finder, even though their sort of descriptions might not suggest that that would be the type of thing that they were more immediately interested in. Um, so from this, if your organization does feature both classical and contemporary work, the data suggests a really high potential to cross audiences over from one to the other. Uh, and in doing that, your reputation and audiences trust in you will likely be important tools in kind of taking classical audiences through that journey to, to contemporary work. Um, a sort of observation around um, less experienced contemporary audiences in general. Um, so the importance there of overcoming the factors that may cause people to feel alienated from your work. So while some of these factors are going to be specific to the particular art form uh, you're interested in, um, this might include focusing on familiar aspects such as a story or theme, um, allaying any concerns around quality, um, as well as providing clarity on the type um, of experience people can expect to have at an event and any, providing any kind of helpful pre-information. And overall, um, again, another observation in targeting audiences for contemporary arts, being really clear on the different motivations and expectations of the audience groups that you're looking to engage. So um, thinking about factors such as which groups are looking to be challenged in their, in their arts attendance, who's looking for a social experience, who's seeking a particular arts offer, such as a particular art form, an artist, or, or a cultural relevance and association. And the last, the last um, point I wanted to highlight was around, was around younger audiences. Um, we know that contemporary arts often attract a higher proportion of younger people than traditional or classical forms. And we've seen that, for example, in particular in audiences for contemporary visual arts. Um, and, and it's particularly reflected here, I think, in the findings from the Cultural Participation Monitor um, in trends towards younger people for those who only have a higher interest in contemporary arts and those with a higher interest in both classical and contemporary. Um, there's, a, there's a consideration of potential risk emerging um, from the pandemic that I just wanted to highlight uh, uh, connected to young people. Um, and that's around how lack of available opportunities over the last two years might have affected their developing habits of arts attendance. Uh, and especially um, those at a sort of a formative age, such as late teens, early 20s. So we don't have the data yet to show what, what's happening in that sense. Um, and it's too soon to tell. But I think, I think that's something that particularly I'd be really interested in keeping an eye on over the next few months. Thank you. Fab, thank you, Catherine. Um, so that's just a, a few things to draw out of those 
two particular pieces of evidence around contemporary audiences. Um, obviously, there's lots of other work um, that you know, we've done that I'm sure you've done um, in terms of understanding who these audiences contemporary contemporary work are and what's what's driving them. 